So today we're going to look at, um, or start to look at, some of the different ways to calculate the enthalpy of a reaction. Um, you can see this list. We're going to slowly go through the list as days progress. And today, specifically, we're going to look at the use of stoichiometry and calorimetry to solve for enthalpy. In following days, we'll be looking at some other methods like the flippy thing, using the Big Mama equation, and also the use of bond energy to calculate enthalpy. Keep in mind that enthalpy, along with entropy and free energy, are state functions. So there are a lot of different ways to solve for those values, and this is the start of that. So I'd like to start with the easiest one, and that's using stoichiometry to determine the enthalpy of a reaction or the enthalpy of, you know, the reaction of a certain number of grams given the enthalpy of the reaction. So if you look at this first example, it says consider the combustion of propane, and it gives you the balanced equation for propane. And if you notice, there is a delta H value next to that. Well, this delta H value actually is the amount of energy that's released, because it's exothermic, when the combustion of propane happens, and specifically when one mole of propane is combusted. The units that we actually prefer to use on problems like this that you'll see on the AP is kilojoules per mole of reaction. So for every one mole of this whole reaction, um, we give off neg we give off negative 2,221 2, kilojoules. Um, so let's look at this problem. It says, assume that all of the heat comes from the combustion of propane. Calculate the delta H in which five grams of propane is burned in excess oxygen at a constant pressure. So when we see a value like this associated with an equation, we can be rest assured that it is a stoichiometric relationship. So for every one mole of this, there's five moles of this, there's three moles of this, there's four moles of this, and there's negative 2221 kilojoules of energy. So we can use that in an actual stoichiometry problem. So we're going to start with our 5.00 grams of our propane. And like always, we're going to convert to moles when we do stoichiometry. So for every one mole of propane, if you do the molar mass from the periodic table, you have 44.1 grams of propane. And for each reaction that we have, for every one mole of um, propane, we're getting it from the stoichiometric relationship. We have negative 2221 kilojoules. And when you do the math here, you get negative 252 kilojoules. So if we were like finding it based on the oxygen, we would say for every five moles of oxygen, we have negative 2221 kilojoules. So we can treat this just like any other coefficient. Next problem is super easy. If you take a look at the reaction, um, here they say the enthalpy for the formation is shown below. So they're forming, if you look, 4 to 1 to 2, and that is this much. The question is, what is the amount of heat released when one mole of sodium oxide is formed? Well, we formed 2 to that, so we're going to start our stoichiometry with 1 mole of Na2O. And then we can say, well, for every two moles, based on the rate relationship, we have negative 828. So ultimately, you're just dividing it by two. And if you saw that, that's fine. I just like setting it up in a stoichiom stoichiometric way that you can use all the time. So negative 414 is the answer for that problem. Okay, we're going to do a couple more of these um, in problem six. The enthalpy for the decomposition of iron three oxide is shown below. And they want to know what the enthalpy for the following reaction is. So this is kind of a goal equation. We want to know the enthalpy, um, what the enthalpy is if we know the enthalpy of this. Well, if you look up, you can see that that's strictly the reverse of the given equation. So this were endothermic up here. It's going to be exothermic if you reverse the equation. So that's easy. And then the final one is determine the amount of heat released when one gram of ethanol is combusted. So they give us a balanced equation for ethanol here, and we're going to combust one gram of it. So let's start our dimensional analysis. 
we have our stoichiometry, we have our one gram of our ethanol. Well, for every one mole of ethanol, if you do the molar mass, it comes out to be 46.07 from the periodic table. And then there's the one to this relationship. So for every one mole of ethanol, we have negative one, three, six, seven kilojoules. So our final answer is negative 29.7 kilojoules released. And if you really want to say this, you can say per gram of ethanol because that's the, that is the case. We combusted one gram and that's how many kilojoules were released. But negative 297 kilojoules for units is sufficient. So another way to find a heat of reaction is to use calorimetry, which requires the use of an equation that we always term as Q equals M cat. Um, the first few problems I'm going to work with you guys is it calorimetry based, but it shows you how to utilize this equation and what units to use. So M is always the mass of the solution usually solute plus solvent. It's got to be a total mass. C is the specific heat capacity of the solution, which is always in joules per gram degrees Celsius. And um, delta T is temperature final minus initial. Um, you can use, it doesn't really matter if you degree Celsius or Kelvin because we're finding a difference on the scale. So if we have zero to 100 degrees Celsius, that would be 273 to 373. Whoops, 373. So the difference would still be the same. So don't freak out if they give you Kelvin for both your final and initial temperatures. Just know that it's always final minus, minus initial when you're doing that math. So let's go ahead and work a couple problems with this. Um, number eight says how much heat must be added to change the temperature of 250 grams of water from 25 to 60. When you see a temperature change like that and they're asking about heat, you can go ahead and just assume they use MCAT. So Q equals MC delta T. Um, our mass of water is 250 grams. You're going to need to know the specific heat of water. It is on the AP sheet, but it is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's how many joules it requires to raise one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius, and this is specifically water. And then um, final minus initial is 60 minus 25 degrees Celsius. So how much heat must be added? We need to be getting a positive Q because this is proving to be endothermic. And when you do the math, we get 37,000 joules. So that did come out to be endothermic. Number nine, if 2.09 joules are required to change the temperature of 15 grams of mercury by one degree Celsius, calculate the specific heat of mercury. So again, if we want to find... The specific heat, we're going to use Q equals MCAT. It says if 2.09 joules are required to change the temperature by a degree, we're just going to go ahead and leave everything positive in this equation because you cannot have a negative specific heat anyway, and we have the delta as a positive one. So we're just going to go ahead and make that a positive heat. Our mass is 15.0 grams. We're solving for a specific heat, and they told us all our delta T was one degree Celsius. When you solve, we get a specific heat of 0.139, and you have to put units on this stuff, joules per gram degree Celsius. All right, this next problem, not too hard, just a, a little bit of algebra. We're actually, it looks like here, we're solving for the final temperature. So um, we can either solve for delta T and then solve for the final. I just like to put all of it in the equation. So again, we're going to use Q equals MCAT. And in this equation, they say the final temperature after 1575 joules of heat are removed. That is crucial because what does that mean? It means it's exothermic, which means we have to make that 1575 joules negative. Don't forget to do that. Um, our mass is 85.0 grams. 
2.4 is the specific heat of the solution, as they told you in the problem. And then we're going to solve for final, and, and minus initial for our delta T is that. So it's not a hard problem to set up. Now you just have to do math. I'm going to highly encourage you to, to check your math twice. Maybe once you get this final temperature solved for, it comes out to be 15.8. Once you solve for that, go ahead and plug it back in. And then check your math again that way to make sure you get those joules. So you definitely need to double check your work because there's a lot of places you can make math errors. Um, next problem, number 11. Number 11 uh, looks to me like it's what I call a MCAT equals MCAT. Um, a 28.4 gram sample of an unknown metal was heated to 110 degrees Celsius and plunged into a 100 gram sample of water initially at a temperature of 24.6. And then they give you the final temperature of the mixture. So what's going on here is that you're heating up a piece of metal to a super, super high temperature, and you're chunking it in water, and you want to find the specific heat of the metal. So um, conceptually, the heat that the metal loses is equal to the heat that the water gains, thanks to the conservation of mass. Um, and again, thanks to signs, we know that it's going to be negative Q because when we lose heat, um, it's a um, negative sign, and when we gain heat, it's positive. You really need to make one of the sides negative because you want the delta T to work out appropriately. So this is really negative M cat equals positive M cat. And that's, that's easy to remember. Just make one of them negative. So I like to just cons be consistent. I put the metal um, on the negative side because that's the thing losing the heat. So I'm just going to plug into MCAT starting with negative. And my metal is 28.4 grams. I'm solving for the specific heat of the metal. And my final temperature of both solution, both the metal and the water are going to be the same because they're going to reach an equilibrium. And my initial temperature of the metal is 110, and that's going to be equal to the mass of the water, and that's 4.18. For the sake of room, I'm not going to write the units, and my delta T is 25.34 minus 24.6. You notice how the delta T for the water is not very big, and that is attributed to the fact that water has the highest specific heat of any substance that we're going to be dealing with. So, hey, that's awesome. Um, that makes sense. So the bigger your specific heat is, the less of a delta T you're going to have. So if you go here, and you can see if you solve for C at this point, you're going to get a final specific heat of water of 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius. And again, I'm going to highly encourage you guys to double check your math before you do a final report. Um, whenever you're doing Q equals MCAT, just remember you can never have a positive C and you can never have, I'm sorry, back it up. You can never have a negative specific heat. Negative specific heat would be amazing. If you have a negative specific heat, as you heat something up, it cools itself down, which would be cray cray. Um, you can't have a, have a negative specific heat, and you can't have a negative mass. So remember that when you solve for things. So as you know on the AP, you're going to have to work a lot of problems without a calculator. So sometimes you're just going to have to analyze and kind of logic through some things. And these are good examples of some problems that you can do that. So if you look at this problem, it says a 100-gram sample of water at 90 degrees Celsius is added to a 100-gram sample water of 10 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of the water is, instead of using Q equals MCAT, you're not going to have a calculator. It's kind of crazy. Just look at it and look at what's going on. We have equal masses of water, right? And we know that both waters have the same specific heat. Because we're mixing them, we can go ahead and assume that the final temperature is kind of going to be an average of those two. So that's basically what it is. If you have a 90 and a 10, oh, and you divide that by 2, the average is about 50. So that would be the final temperature. 
And again, we know that because we have the equal mass and the same specific heat of both substances. Um, for the next one, a 10, 100 gram sample of water at 90 degrees is added to a 500 gram sample water of 10 degrees. Um, so we're, again, we have the same specific heat in both of these problems. But if you notice, we have five times the amount of the cold water. So since we have that much more cold water, we know that the temperature range has to be closer to that of the colder range. So that would be C. And again, you can do that without necessarily having to do any crazy calculations. And in this final comparison problem, um, we have a styrofoam cup and it's got 50 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius and we're adding the same amount of mass of stuff of, of an iron ball and it's at 90 degrees, 900, oops, no, 90 degrees Celsius. And then they give you the specific heat of water, which is always high, and then a specific heat of the iron. So if you look, we have the same mass of substance, but we can't just average the temperatures because their specific heats are so different. Water, though, has so, so much higher of a specific heat that our final temperature, because our masses are the same, has to be closer to the temperature change that the water experienced. So if you look, water was at the 10 degrees. That was at the colder temperature. So the final temperature will be closer to that of the water because, again, water specific heat was so much higher. So now we're going to get into um, the most important part of what we're doing today, and that's the use of coffee cup calorimetry. In coffee cup calorimetry, we're going to always find delta H of a reaction and through the use of MCAT and potentially something else. So normally when you do coffee cup calorimetry, you put both your reactants and products into a coffee cup, and we're going to be doing this in lab. Um, you're then going to put in a thermometer and measure the temperature initial and then the temperature final, and then you can use Q equals MCAT to solve for the Q. Now, the only time you just use Q equals MCAT is when we assume that no heat was lost to the outside. However, sometimes heat does get lost, and when that happens and we're given information about that, we have to account for that heat as well as the heat that goes to the thermometer. So we're going to look at two kinds of problems, and I will talk about how to solve for that. The only other thing I want to point out on this slide is this molar heat capacity. Sometimes specific heat is in joules per gram degree Celsius. Sometimes it's in joules per mole degree Celsius. That's the exact same thing, except this now is called the molar heat capacity. If you're given molar heat capacity, when you do Q equals MCAT, you have to put your M in moles instead of grams, if it happens. It might happen in homework. It doesn't happen very often. I just want you to know that molar heat capacity is something that does exist. Okay, so let's look at this first coffee cup problem. It says when 1.095 grams of sodium hydroxide is dissolved in 150 grams of water initially at 23.5 degrees Celsius, the final temperature is found to be 25.32 calculate the heat liberated. So we better be getting an exothermic reaction. I'm going to jot that down because there's something you'll need to look at. Um, assume the specific heat of the solution is the same as that of water and assume that no heat is absorbed by the calorimeter. Ugh, that should make you happy when you see that because that made us have a much easier problem. So just to remind you, we have our coffee cup and we're going to put both the sodium hydroxide and the water in the coffee cup and we're going to measure the temperature change as that sodium hydroxide dissolves. When we do our Q equals MCAT, because that's all that's called for in this problem, we need to put the sum of both of those into the mass. That is crucial. So let's set it up. Q is equal to, that's 151.095 grams. All right, because we're taking it of the whole solution. They said that the specific heat of the solution is the same as that of water, so we're going to put 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius in here, and then our delta T is final, minus initial, 25.3 minus 
So our Q then, when we do our math, is 1150 joules. Uh-oh, didn't we say it needed to be exothermic? Why is this endothermic? This is an important step that you have to add. If you think about what's happening, whenever you use a thermometer in a calorimetry problem, this is a step you'll have to take into account. Negative Q is always equal to the heat of the reaction. And why is that? Well, up here, if we have this dissolving happen, right, and it is liberating heat, that heat is going to the thermometer. The thermometer then is absorbing the heat. So when we do our delta T, we're doing it from the perspective of the thermometer. What did the thermometer do? The thermometer absorbed. So that's why we got a positive here. So you always have to change the sign when you use a thermometer to do it from the perspective of the, the system, not the surroundings. So our actual answer then, our delta H for the reaction, is equal to negative 1150 joules. You always have to change your sign in coffee cup calorimetry. Super crucial. All right, our next calorimetry problem says a 50 gram sample of 0.2 molar sodium bromide at 23.65 is added to a coffee cup calorimeter containing 50 grams of 0.2 at the same initial temperature. If the heat capacity of the calorimeter is 65.0, oh no, that's sad. What that means is that some heat has escaped when you see that. The calorimeter has a capacity itself for heat, so it absorbed the heat. And it gives you the specific heat of the solution and the final temperature. Notice they did not say, assume no heat is lost to the environment. That's another clue. If they do not tell you no heat is lost, we're going to have to take into account the heat that escaped. So at the end of the day, we need the heat that went to the thermometer. And to that, we're going to add to it the heat that escaped the reaction. So how do we do both? Well, we already know the heat to the thermometer. We're going to use Q equals M cap. The heat that escaped, we're going to find that heat by taking the heat lost by the calorimeter, known as the heat capacity of the calorimeter, which is a capital C, times that same delta T. So I always say M cat plus cat, where this C is that number they gave us that we have never seen before. So once we find both those Qs, we're going to add them up because this is the heat that went to the thermometer and this is the heat that escaped. So the heat of the reaction is the sum of those two. So let's go ahead and focus on the MCAT first. Q is equal to 100 grams times the specific heat of the solution they said was 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then final is 25.4 minus 23.65. When you do the math, I got a Q of 735 joules. That's how much heat went to the thermometer. And to that, I'm going to add, let's find Q equals cat, C of the calorimeter for every X number of joules, or sorry, for every X number of degrees Celsius, we give off so many joules, and every calorimeter is going to have a different value for that. And our delta T is the same it was before, 25.4 minus 23.65. So when we do the math here, I get a Q of 849 joules. So what I do is I add both of those up, and I get a Q of, oh no, that was an 849 I did bad math. Math is hard. That was the actual answer that I gave you. The heat lost by the calorimeter. I was wondering, I was like, you can't lose more heat than you actually go to the thermometer unless you have the worst calorimeter ever. All right, so that's how much heat escaped. That's how much heat went to the thermometer. The sum of those two then is 849 joules. But again... The problem says, calculate the heat released. So we know it has to be exothermic. 
Why? Well, because we know that negative Q is equal to delta H. So my final answer here is negative 849 joules. And that's how much energy in total the reaction releases. So to recap this one more time, because it's super important that we understand, whenever we're doing coffee cup calorimetry, it's always Q equals MCAT. If they say no heat is lost to the environment, we just use that. If they give us a heat capacity of the calorimeter, we have to add to that total Q equals CAT. And then we add the Q equals MCAT to the CAT to get the total heat in the reaction. And then our final step is always to change the sign.